Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Tina Rosenquist and this is Knowledge for Wellness. And this program is to enhance your overall understanding of information provided to you because the more you know, the empowerment you have to make better decisions for yourself and your loved ones. And today I am delighted to bring on Sharon. And I was lucky enough to meet Sharon at the Association for Transformative Leadership last night. And welcome, Sharon. I'm Thank so you. glad that you could join us. It's and wonderful to be here. I appreciate it so much. Yes, and you have a book on taking the war out of our words. Yes. And that was such a great presentation that she gave to us last night that we decided to throw it together here at the Marriott, downtown Minneapolis. Yes. And it's just such an honor to meet you. You are from the San Francisco, California area? Yes, I am. Great, mm -hmm. great. Yes, yes. Okay. And first of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about, of course, your love, your passion, and why you wanted to introduce this book and also get this word out to our viewers. Actually, long before I knew that I was going to develop what people are referring to as a new paradigm for communication, um, even as a young child, I was thinking about uh, certain questions that puzzled me. For example, when people would say it was just human nature to be violent, I always thought that seemed more like an illness than a healthy way of being. And the other thing that I would hear as a comment from people off and on was that if somebody got their feelings hurt, I would hear them say, well, I'm never going to let her or him know that they hurt my feelings. And I would think, how are you ever going to resolve it if you're not able to tell the person and talk about it? And I didn't realize at the time, but those two um, thoughts that I was mulling over in my mind became the foundation of my work at a much later time. And I think the other driving force for me was that I always felt that there was so much pain in people's lives that wouldn't have to be there because it was from misunderstanding. So I think I did identify at a very young age that there was something about how we communicated that was very, very wrong. And so over a period of many years, um, again, without quite knowing what I was doing, I began to evolve an understanding of what was wrong and then ultimately to create a, a new method of communication that is very different from how we've communicated traditionally. That's such a great idea of what you came up with in regards to that. So I basically want to know what do you mean when you say that we use the rules of war for conversation? Well, actually over many years of observing people and thinking about this process, what I ended up deciding is that, um, that we have actually, not even just metaphorically, but literally used the rules of war as the basis for how we communicate with each other. So, for example, if you look in the dictionary at the word question, it's never defined with the word curiosity, but it's defined over and over again with words like interrogation, which is clearly a war word. Right. Sharon, this is such a different concept, you know, from what we've been raised with. Yes. And, and so I'd like you to maybe give an example for our viewers, and maybe they can kind of put it into their own life mm -hmm. and yes. absorb it a little bit more. If you can give an, an example of how the communication can be powerful. Yes, um, I, I'd like to give a simple example about a little girl that was riding on the bus. Okay. And her name is Maria, and every day there was a boy on the bus who was bullying her and harassing her. As we know, bullying can be an incredible problem and has become a huge problem in this country. And it's difficult to resolve. When Maria went home, she told her mom, Mom, that boy on the bus just won't leave me alone. He keeps saying awful things to me. And her mom thought, what am I going to do? She's only 10 years old. I can't ride the bus to school with her every day. So she decided to help her daughter ask a single non-defensive question of the boy based on information she'd learned at a conference um, that uh, um, I think probably just within the last week or two she had heard me speak at a conference. And her daughter said, okay mom, I'll try it. And her mom helped her with the tone of voice. She got back on the bus the next day and when she came home that night, she said, Mom, it was really weird. Her eyes were wide and she said, you know, I didn't think it was going to work, but I did just what you said. And when he started saying that stuff, I just looked at him and I was really calm. And I said, do you think I want you to talk to me that way? And you know what? He kind of squinted at me funny and he always sits in the seat beside, behind me and he backed up and then he went, well, no, I guess not. 
and he never said another word to me. And the amazing end of this story is that I met the mother when I spoke at the same conference again a year later, and she came running up to me, she told me the story, and the very end of the story was that that boy never harassed her daughter again. Now, we are not used to the idea that our children, or even us as adults, could deal with any kind of conflict or harassment or bullying with a single question and have it go away. But when I teach non-defensive communication, I show people how to have a different intention, tone of voice, body language when they ask the questions. And by staying in their own personal power and not getting hooked into the power struggle, the, the results are tremendous. And I, I have um, dozens, probably hundreds of stories where people have been able to resolve conflict that quickly when they stay non-defensive. Now, if she had said to him defensively, why are you talking to me that way, what do you think would have happened? Well, typically, she would have bit into his, his taunting of her, and he would have had control over her, and he would have been enjoying it, and he would have kept doing it. So in that sense, the non-defensive process was far more powerful than being defensive. That's such a great story. I have a little bit with my own with my son. My son was very, very small. Uh, growing up in high school and we had kind of the same scenario going on in regards to a lot of making fun of him mm -hmm. so him and I did a little bit of role-playing because mm -hmm. I am small framed mm -hmm. but it's okay for a female in yes. this society to be yes. small frame but for a, for a man yes. you know he got teased he got uh, taped he got thrown in lockers he also got oh. you know some variables that happened to him and so we did a little bit of role playing and what we did was I threw out questions to him so that when someone else would say it, he wouldn't act so defensively. Yes. In the sense of, you know, somebody standing over him and saying, you're short. And we would look up and say, and tell me something I don't know. <laughs> you know, we kind of... So you taught him how to joke about it. Right. You know, yes. in a sense... But, but not in a defensive way joking, just mm -hmm. in a relaxed way. Right. Yes. And so I kind of maybe created my own little version of yes, your, you did. what you did. Yes, you did. And he was okay with himself yes. and his size. Yes. And he graduated high school at maybe 5'8", mm -hmm. went off to college, and he's now... Uh, six feet, one inch. Oh no! <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes. So it's a cute little story because yes. he had what they call delayed growth syndrome. Yes. And he went off to college, and I said it had to be in the water of the college. Oh. Uh -huh. And he grew up, and uh, that was such a great little thing. But had I, like I said, had I have known then what you are putting out to us. Yes. But what a great mm -hmm. concept for our younger generation yes. Yes. because we do as we age and we get a little bit older. We want to pass off knowledge to the and those, youth. And those things are so painful for them. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just when we're young, you know. In business, they used to say, don't bring your personal feelings to the workplace. But now we know, of course, we all bring our feelings to the workplace. Mm -hmm. And um, studies, uh, Dr. Mary Rao uh, coined the phrase micro inequities. And she showed that it isn't one big incident that causes someone to quit a job. Mm -hmm. It's it's what she calls small insults that do damage. And so those little wounds that we get, mm -hmm. whether it's at work or at home, that are repetitive, um, are very painful. It's like, it's like getting a thorn and then never taking the thorn out and continuing to rub it. So yeah. to be able to ask a question or make a statement and, and hold your own personal power, mm -hmm. really, it, it just prompts other people to drop their defenses. So Sharon, you also mentioned something about, you know, um, a power struggle that is an addiction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think of an addiction, I think of alcohol, drugs, things of that nature. I don't really think of a power struggle because I know as a parent, you get into power struggles because you want what is best for your child <laughs> and you've experienced it a little bit, you know. So if you could share that with our viewers, that would be great. Okay. Um, yes, what I say is that I believe that power struggle is actually the most pervasive and least recognized addiction on earth. The characteristics of addiction are that it's something that we get engaged in, we can't break free of it, we need more of it, and so in a substance addiction like alcohol, what we want is the alcohol. In power struggle, what we're after is the control, the power,